Welcome to Two Quants and a Financial Planner, where we bridge the worlds of investing and financial planning to help investors achieve their long-term goals. Join Matt Ziegler, Jack Forehand, and me, Justin Carbonell, as we cover a wide range of investing and planning topics that impact all of us and discuss how we can apply them in the real world to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. So Matt, I think it's fair to say the first half of 2024 was what, as interesting the word we would use? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the right word for it is. Yeah, I think uh, interesting, fascinating, um... We, uh, yeah, I don't know. Welcome to 2024. It simultaneously feels like it's been 2024 for 10 years and 10 seconds. It's July 3rd. Yeah, it is crazy how much has been going on. And, and just to introduce the episode, we, we wanted to do an episode where we look back at the first half and, and we talk about everything from the economy all the way down to what's going on in the factor world and just talk about what we expected going in, what we actually saw and we have a ton of charts here. We want to bring in some interesting charts we've, we've kind of pulled together throughout the end of the quarter here that show some of the things that are going on under the hood. And, and we thought it'd be really interesting to do that and to just dig into what's been going on behind the scenes in the market and the economy. I think that's a great idea. I think there's so much data that this is the other thing. The, the stories, as they're presented to us in the news and in other things, there's a number of these charts we're going to show that I don't think... Like we all laugh in the financial industry about how there's people who think the stock market is down this year or like think things are like the political surveys are coming in and people think the economy is doing way worse than it actually is or way better than it actually is. These ideas come from somewhere. And a lot of times they come from an idea that's a little bit stale or out of place. We both have the benefit of constantly being forced to look at charts and data and have conversations about this stuff. But I don't think, like, if you're not in a allocating or an investing seat actively every day, you're probably not thinking about, like, where some of this stuff is. And even though we look at some of this stuff every day, a lot of these charts are things that I think you and I both find kind of surprising from what we would have intuitively sensed the narrative to be. Yeah, and a lot of people's real world does not look like the stock market. Um, we'll talk about the leadership of the big companies and stuff, and that's part of it, too. You know, people have maybe a different view. They have a view on what's going on in the real world in their lives in the economy or in whatever's going on with them. And, and they tie that to the stock market and then they see the separation. And that's what makes them think maybe the stock market is down. Um, so it, it can be challenging. And also, in every mostly we're going to try not to do this, but pretty much anybody who presents these charts is presenting them with some sort of opinion tied to it. Um, and, and that can affect people and, and you know everyday people as well a lot. Because a lot of these charts, if you want to spin them one way or the other, you can. And that affects how people view them. But we're going to try to just kind of look down the middle and, and talk more about what actually happened and maybe what we can learn from it. I used to have framed on my wall in my office. It's somewhere off to the side here in a frame still. And it's this, this little picture and it says, the plural of anecdote is not data. And it's to remind us, and it used to remind me on the wall in my office for a long, long time, that whatever your anecdotal experience is, whatever the thing you remember does not actually make a broader quilt of the reality of like the world that we're living in. It's easy to get a story in our heads. It's easy to get a concept in our minds that we think is true, or maybe we even know to be true at one point of time. That's no longer true at the current present or whatever the situation may be. This idea of like our anecdotal experience, our own observations don't necessarily rhyme with the broader set of what's actually going on in the world. It's hugely important that we pause and reflect back on this stuff. I got one other thing for you too. Uh, hey, our uh, our Rick Ferry episode, our lessons learned episode, it's been doing pretty well, I think. Pretty yeah. happy with the way that came out. You? It'll, it'll be one of our biggest ones ever, I think, when it's done. But if you haven't seen it, please go watch it. Uh, Jack, I have to announce, I have to do a, I have a public apology to make from this one. And it's not to Rick Ferry. Rick Ferry did appreciate it. I don't know if you saw that on LinkedIn. He did like the episode. <laughs> oh, that's good. He, he uh, liked all your Kiss songs, obviously. Apparently, and we got some great write-ins. So I have to make a public apology. I, and this will segue into the beginning of our charts where anecdotes and our memories are sometimes flawed. I misremembered something about the Kiss song, Beth. And I told the story about how Beth was their highest charting song. And uh, in the great tradition of keep it simple, stupid, like it's just one of those surprising things. You wouldn't think it's the most popular song, but anecdotally, 
or uh, empirically, it actually is. Now, anecdotally, I remembered both one of my good college buddies, Mike, being a huge fan of the song. I was correct about that. I had a beer with Mike and his wife last night. He verified he was right. The person I had wrong, though, is my wife does not like the song back. Her dad liked it, tried to convince her. She was never convinced. So she's at least on my team, but I misrepresented her opinion. Ziegler household, boo, Beth, we're not putting it on. Let's go to some charts. I think, well, I think when you get things wrong with the wife, the apology is the way to go. Um, I, think, I think that's something a lot of us learned over time. So that was, a good, that was a good approach to this. It's a good approach to make a public on the record statement after being publicly on the record wrong. Yeah, and I mean, the real test of any relationship is, uh, you know, problems songs. are always, are, yeah, are just finding, <laughs> finding love in kiss songs. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I can't. Staying far away from invoking any kiss song in Take us to the so, charts. Give me a let's, 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 let's start place. with this. Let's start with inflation because that was really what everybody's been talking about. It was everybody was talking about going into the year. I mean, maybe people are talking about it a little bit less, but it's still top of mind for a lot of people. And and I think my takeaway from inflation from the beginning of the year is mostly, you know, most people were wrong um, on both sides of the whole thing. You know, the, the people who thought we were coming down to the two percent and you know we're going to be sustainably there at least so so far haven't been correct. It's been stickier than people thought, but also the the doom and gloom five six percenters. Um, that hasn't happened either. So we, we've kind of had this three, and we, we've talked about how it's very hard to measure inflation and who knows what the true inflation rate is and all that stuff. But if you want to use the the publicly available metrics, I mean, we've had something in the threes. Um, we're kind of just sitting there. We're not going back to two. We're not going up a lot. It, it's just kind of been, you know, that that's it's been sitting there in that place. And it's going to be an interesting thing. We'll talk about the Fed later. It's an interesting place to be because you, you are above the target. It's not some horrible, awful thing. You know, what do you do from here is interesting, but we'll get into that later. But the, the general idea is I think a lot of people were wrong on inflation. It's been above target. It's kind of hanging out there. One of the big things with inflation that we're still hearing a lot about, and whether it's the throwback memories to eggflation, what, two years ago, if it's the throwback memories to just like, whether it's gas at the pump or the groceries at the store or the cost of medicine, a lot of people still feel like, and here we are getting into the prime of election season, where the cost of living is just the cost of living is just too high. A way to track back against this, and this gets into this graphic. So first off, the Fed cuts didn't materialize. The stuff that we thought would lower rates didn't seem to materialize. The inflation rate just hasn't gone back to zero or even back down to sub two into that range. So if it's still here and so many people are still feeling that, does that actually tell the story? So with this graphic, one of the things we're seeing here that's really, I think, important to zoom out on because it's counterintuitive is to look at ways to map uh, wages and wage growth against actual cost inflation. Now, got to ask, not not your personal experience per se, Jack, but like if you had to guess, would you would you guess that inflation is higher than wage growth or the other way around? What would your guess have been? Oh, over this period or over history or over what? Uh, why don't you just say like over the last like year or two? Yeah, well, actually, I was just listening to a podcast with uh, Jeremy Siegel, where he was kind of saying, I mean, he was saying basically they've been about the same, but we'll, we'll see what your, what does your data show? Yeah. Well, the, the data shows, and again, your experience is going to be different than what the data says. There's no average worker. There's no average inflation rate. But this idea here is that we're actually seeing wages and wage growth has actually been above inflation for probably about the last year. And actually, if you base these numbers to zero, there's some data that shows over the last two years, it's actually been pretty good. We felt the pain of inflation back in like 2021. And as we got into the pandemic, really, we felt inflation outstrip wage growth for a period of time. That has actually declined. The Fed keeps saying remarks about this. They keep pulling up their data that says, no, like we think the average worker is doing okay against cost inflation. But it's, it's hard to parse that out. It's especially hard to parse that out. And I wonder if uh, Jeremy Siegel is making this point. That if you just look at the data in like the trailing month, quarter, or year period, it looks pretty close to neck and neck, or it looks like it's keeping pace. As soon as you zoom out over the last several years, and this chart here goes back to, I want to say it's March of 2020, that chart will actually show you a bit of a different picture where, yes, we have uh, wage inflation is actually running above cost inflation, above CPI, and that's, uh, that's actually a pretty good thing for the consumer. It means if you're employed and working, you've been able to not only afford your cost of living, but you're maybe not by a lot, but that, that wage growth is outstripping the inflation 
uh, piece. That's, that's kind of a big deal. That's very supportive of economic activity. Yeah, that, his point was basically over time, over the long haul, wage growth does. He, he was saying like real wage growth is something like 1% over the absolute long term. So you, you, wage growth does outstrip inflation over time. Um, he, he was arguing, and I think it was like three, four years or something like that. You know, it's been back and forth, as you see in this chart. There's been times, you know, where it's been, where wage growth has been higher. There's been times where inflation has been higher. But he was arguing it's, it's more netted out to zero here. Um, hmm. And what, what he was arguing is basically that it's not, you know, people have talked about how much wage growth has been, but the reality is real, real wage growth has not been out of line with history in this period um, because inflation is higher as well. So if you look at it in real terms, it's not that, it, it, it might be actually a little bit less than, than what it's been in history, um, despite the fact that it's been high. It's really interesting. It's really supportive of economic growth and the economic data because if people are gainfully employed, and I say gainfully here as on average getting raises, those people are spending money. If the money they spend is more than the amount that the costs of things are going up, we tend to have positive GDP growth. We tend to have positive economic activity and it's hard to have a recession. So this was a really powerful and kind of eye-opening chart. And again, usually we see this chart and it's only, it's a year at most. We look at wage growth over the last 12 months, or we look at CPI over the last 12 months, sometimes even shorter periods than we annualize the number. Actually seeing this zoomed out over a multi-year period, I think is really useful and really powerful in the view. Because the other thing this shows you is that starting somewhere around like the March 2023 period, the beginning of 2023, that's where we crossed over that equilibrium uh, in the growth rates. And really since then, the CPI has been below the wage rate. And that's, that's like a, another powerful example of why the consumer has been in pretty good shape. And this also shows, and Bob, Bob Elliott's made this point on our podcast, and we actually just put out an episode with him today. The idea is you can't have 5% or whatever it is, wage growth and 2% inflation. So this is going to make it hard for inflation to come down. Right. Because if people are making, if, they're, if what they make keeps going up at that rate, they're going to spend the money. So you're not going to be, you know, 5% wage growth and 2%, you know, inflation is not a sustainable equilibrium. So the wage, one of those is going to have to probably, is going to have to adjust over time. We don't have 2% inflation right now. We have, you know, wage growth and inflation as, as we see it in front of us. But the idea is that wage growth is a very, very important driver of inflation. It's an important thing to keep in mind, you know, as we look into the future and what might happen to inflation, it's really important to watch wage growth. Last point on this is that, that gap between the reality and the expectations and the way people think of it, this is an important driver of inflation having a floor under it too. Because what you just said, anybody you know, and this is where the anecdotes get, I think, a little bit skewed. If you know somebody on a fixed income, just social security and stuff, you know that they're complaining about grocery bills, heating bills in the winter, air conditioning bills in the summer. The fixed income people are feeling this probably the tightest. If you know somebody who's trying to buy a house or buy a car or buy a single ticket item, it's easy to extrapolate the increases in some of those places, which are not as big of a piece of like the CPI calculation. We've done the inflation episode, but is like, that's if, if your experience is you're trying to buy a, a house right now and you're like between interest rates and the cost of the house, I don't feel like I can afford this right now or it's out of my range or the bank won't approve me. There's all these pockets that make us feel another way. Spending that money and feeling like we have to spend that money because like, what good is it to wait? Because everything, the price just keeps going up and up and up. That supports prices too. That's inflationary. Let's jump to our next chart. Jack, I've been asking this. My, my poor little retirement account with its small cap value exposure. Where are the small cap value returns? I was promised. First so, trust, what say ye? <laughs> you can look at, this is a great chart you sent to me. And, and you can look at this in two ways. You can look at this as a reason for, so what we're seeing here is the performance of various things. It's, I'll just read it off the chart. Average real returns during years when inflation is greater than the median. And inflation is going to be greater than the median this year. At least it seems like it. Uh, again, people will argue if you change the metrics or whatever, but this is based on the actual CPI. So it's probably going to be above 2.7% this year. So you could look at that as reason for optimism. Um, if we continue having these high rates of inflation, small cap value is going to come back. But you also could say, what, which is what I've been saying to myself and what you just said, which is where are my returns? Um, because my small cap value stocks, you know, 12%, is the average real return during these, these periods. And they have certainly not been at the top of the list. Um, and you can see other things like large cap growth stocks way, way down the list, um, despite this year being at the absolute top of the list. So there's not a ton to talk about with this, but it is interesting. I thought this was interesting data to look at. And you know, hopefully we'll look at it in the positive way. Hopefully this is a sign 
um, that some of this small cap value stuff might be doing better in the future um, if we continue to have above median uh, inflation. I'll say this too, and quick shout out, uh, Lee Bodoris, that's uh, my director of research at Sunpoint Investments. Lee's great because Lee's always gathering these charts and insights. He does a whole series on LinkedIn, does a chart of the week. A bunch of these charts came from Lee's thing. If you're not following Lee on LinkedIn, go follow him there because you'll see charts like this on the regular. A chart like this, not just because of us bemoaning small cap value working for us, although that's really the most important thing here, uh, is if you're an allocator and if you think in terms of regimes, if you think of things in terms of how do I build a portfolio around the environment I'm in, depending on the clients that are experiencing this stuff, we... Lots of other people, I am sure, looked at this stuff and go, I got to have a little more small cap value. I need a little bit more energy. I need a little bit more, uh, you know, healthcare utilities and things like that. And the exposure, those all should track better than the S&P 500 in these things. This tends to be a key part of many forms of like regime analysis when inflation is sloping up, sloping down. It's not that you've been caught totally off sides in this move. It's just that you have not been compensated if you leaned into some of these things as much. And that's a reality. Anybody who tends to have these biases is continuing to eat it right now. Any allocator who thinks in terms of like regimes or market cycles, probably eating it a little bit right now. And hey, I mean, we're going to get to it. Don't we all just wish we owned a handful of like growth stocks and some crypto right now? Yeah, no, I wish I was all in on video, which unfortunately I'm not, but, uh, but the, the other thing that I think is important to keep in mind with this is averages are averages. Um, and what that means is there's a bunch of numbers behind that average always when you see an average. So just because something has, you know, a 12% average real return when the CPI is above the median doesn't mean that there weren't years in there that it didn't work out that way. So we're looking at a, a bunch of different things that happened in the past. We're averaging them out and we're trying to learn something from it. But, but underneath there, there's probably a lot you can learn in terms of how correct, how often was it correct? Is it one of those things where it was just had massive returns sometimes, but then negative returns other times. So you, you always have to, with an average, you have to dig in behind the scenes to look at the data and figure out what am I actually getting here? Yeah. How big are the spikes in the really clumpy periods when this worked? And I think this is probably one of those cases too. We'd have to go by exactly how this data was diced up. Uh, also note it's average annual real return. There's some quirks inside of this too. We're not looking at like longer term geometric average, averages or something like that. There's there's a bunch of quirks inside this chart that probably mistells some of that story. However, the lesson's powerful. Like, average is not reality. And uh, certainly, we can look at some of this stuff and go, this is not the reality we are expecting with CPI being above that 2.7% for the last, you know, couple of years. Yeah, and I don't know the data behind this chart, but I do know the data about small cap value in general, and that is absolutely the case. Like, you have these outlier years, you know, like 2000 to 2002, you know, if you average small cap value returns over a long period of time, like you, you have some crazy good years in there that impact that. And that, that doesn't mean you still didn't get, you know, wh whatever the average is. It just, it just means that basically you have to understand what's behind the scenes there. And with small cap value, you can have a lot of bad stuff and like really, really good, crazy stuff, crazy good stuff over short periods of time. Right. When you have a couple of like 50% years and then you, once you start to stretch that out over 20, 30, 40, 50 years with a bunch of zeros and drawdowns and other things in there. The magic of math. Well, take us to this. Let's let's do another wonderful expert prediction. Experts have predicted 20 of the last two recessions. How does the stat get worse every time I hear this bad joke? That's obviously not a real stat. I made that up in the outline, but it is the idea that, you know, coming into this year, we definitely had the recession predictions. And, and we've had the recession predictions over and over and over again. I mean, you always, no matter what, you always have certain people are always predicting recessions, but it seemed like it was a little bit louder than normal. Like we, we had a lot of recession predictions. And so it, it was just, it's just important to understand, like to keep all that stuff in context, context when you get these years where you have lots of recession predictions. And it's also important, and this is, we talked to Bob Elliott about this to understand, like the economy is a barge. Um, and so the economy moves very slowly. And, and particularly what was really interesting that he said is this idea that this has been an income driven cycle versus a debt driven cycle. And those are very, very different things. So if the cycle is driven by my income going up, that's a more stable situation. If, if the cycle is driven by people are buying four houses, you know, in 2007, basically on stated income loans, which is effectively like, I don't even care what your actual income is. Just tell me what it is and I'll give you the four houses. Like that's a much more, you know, that, that's something that could explode. And so these income generated cycles are more stable. They're, they're less prone to these major blowups. It's harder to move them. 
And, and so I, I think that's kind of one of the things a lot of people who have been predicting these recessions and predicting these major moves in one way or the other have gotten wrong in this cycle is that this is this is kind of a barge cycle. It's it's taking its time. It's slowly moving. And, you know, anyone, not that something couldn't blow up tomorrow in the commercial real estate market or something, but in general, this is this has been a slow moving thing. And anybody who's been predicting some major, major move one way or the other has been wrong. This point that you made there about the worst of the worst tends to show up when there's excess and there's borrowing involved. And I think that's one of the things that's been quirky about certainly the last few years, certainly since like COVID is we haven't really seen excessive, silly, there's, there's, let me be clear. There is some very silly borrowing going on out there in, in pockets. But for the most part, we don't have, and I love the example you gave. When I started, when I started in consumer banking before, in like an advisory and an investment related role, there, there were these things back like pre-financial crisis called uh, ninja, ninja loans, we would call them ninjas. Do you, do you remember what a ninja was? Do you remember hearing about this? Is that the one where you could like choose various payment options or something? I remember getting sold that by or attempted to be sold that by someone at some point. They, they were everywhere. I remember like losing at a major bank to like, oh, like this mortgage broker has these ninjas that are doing this. way. So it was, it was if I can remember this correctly, it was no income, uh, no job and no application. Basically, it was what okay, that stood so for. Okay, I, I had that wrong. Uh -huh. And they were bananas, but this is how you got like four houses and then you got borrowing to excess. And when there's borrowing to excess and there's no income, no job to back up, there's no collateral against the thing. That's when you wily e. coyote off the cliff and stuff doesn't just get a little bad. It can get really bad. I'm not saying there's not some signs of like uh, smoke, if not maybe fire in commercial real estate and private credit in a bunch of these areas. But I am saying we don't have some of those obvious areas of excess that are directly tied to the consumer who's most of the economy, who's putting some of that stuff at risk. Now, a slowdown in income, a slowdown in assets, an increase in like debt or the cost of servicing debt or getting that new mortgage. We've seen like all those things, but it seems like every time we get a little adjustment that says early recession, recession warning indicators are flagging up in the last, I don't know, two years. Every time we see one of those, it gets it gets fixed and it gets fixed because income's right there, rising wages are right there, falling costs are right there to help rectify that data. Without a big debt-related excess, we don't seem to have the thing that's going to break us into a meaningful recession just yet or something worse. I'm not saying that's not around the corner. I'm just saying it's kind of wild to look about, like when you say predicted 20 of the last two recessions, I know that's tongue in cheek, but I don't think you're that wrong either. So the, the thing I was talking about was called an option arm. I remember it now. It was basically the idea was you every time you had to make a payment, you could basically pay to whatever the hell you wanted. So you could pay like interest only. You could pay interest in principal. You could pay less than interest only and just make the loan go up. It, it was basically just pay whatever you want and we'll figure it out later, um, which I would I would I think would, I would say is not a, is, does not exist anymore. So that you can still do adjustable rate mortgages and the option arms. So I'll give you the, like all things, kind of like annuities, kind of like, uh, all these things actually have a functional purpose that they work for. I like to, I like to liken them to, do you have in the toolbox, do you have like the star shaped screwdriver? I can never remember what that's called. It's like, oh, like yeah. seat belts and fancy other things. Well, I know whenever you need that thing and you don't have it, it's the most annoying thing of all time because you're trying to jam something else in there and make it work and it, it just doesn't work. And it's never going to work. So the, like, like an arm, just like an annuity, there's lots of financial versions of this. We joke about like the man with the hammer thing, or it's a, to the man with the hammer, every problem looks like a nail. The adjust the the option arm, the like this single premium immediate annuity, all these things are wrong most of the time. But there's like a narrow set of circumstances where they're actually kind of ingenious and kind of amazing. And so, like with arms in particular, one thing that was really great, especially in a falling interest rate environment, or especially in a situation where you again you have to be able to afford to service the loan. But we, we had clients who, this is years and years ago, and even in the last few years, where you're in a situation where you are not committed to paying principal on the loan in many cases, but you know you have, I had a couple clients who had to move for work regularly. So it'd be like three to five years in an area, and then they'd get moved to another part of the country, another area, and they'd do this again. 
uh, rents and everything else, a little bit of a pain in the butt, but basically to get like a seven year, like arm became really sensible. If I'm going to be somewhere for five years, I basically had a fixed rate that was interest only on a piece of property. And then if that piece of property increased in value and I was just going to turn around and sell it, well, the least amount of my money goes down up front because at the front end of a 30 year advertising mortgage, I'm mostly paying interest anyway. Uh, and this is back in the good old mortgage interest deduction days when that made sense because you didn't have the doubled standard deduction. These things were really sensible for people who knew they were going to be in a piece of property for a short amount of time and they knew there was upward bias on those home prices. They were the only ones that it made sense for. Everybody else who was thinking about the family home and all the other stuff needed to stay away from those. But for a handful of people, they were a tremendously useful tool. And I, I had some clients in particular that moved a handful of times over that, uh, you know, mid 2000s into even the last couple of years, those adjustable rate mortgages were, were, were a godsend. They spent way less money doing it the way they did. So we come up with these funny little screwdrivers and these funny little purposes, but we also come up with infinite more ways to use them wrongly. <laughs> and I feel that deeply when we talk about this topic. And just to close out this section, Bob was mentioning in, in the podcast that I think ARMS were, got close to 50% of mortgages at one point. Um, in 2007, you know, so, so this was obviously in, by the way, I don't know if you've tried to, we talked about stated income loans and all that stuff. I don't know if you tried to get a mortgage recently. It's a whole different world. Like, especially like I'm self-employed, like this, the lending standards are incredibly, incredibly high now. So the risk of some sort of debt, at least in that area, like some sort of debt driven problem are much, much less. I mean, it's a completely different world than it was back then. Completely different world. And this is what happens after every crisis. We rewrite the rules to basically insulate some of the risks that we now better understand. And that's one of those things. The appetite for that stuff, getting the, effectively the insurance for the major banks from, you know, the central government on this stuff. Like there's, there's things, there's lessons that are learned. They're just not learned in ways that people often feel like is satisfactory, but it, it just shifts the risk to somewhere else in the system. We'll find another way to blow ourselves up. It's sad, but true. It's coming. <laughs> So let's touch on, we're not going to be Fed watchers or Fed predictors here, but uh, let's at least touch on the Fed because it, it was interesting. I mean, we had, what, seven cuts predicted coming into the year? Um, and, yeah, what do we think, had, like eight or nine? I mean, certainly we've had some. Yeah. And now we have, what, one priced in? Um, yeah, we actually had zero. And now we have, what, maybe one priced in for the rest of the year? I'm not, I'm not sure what it is, but it, it's very, if it's it's one or two at the most. Um, so obviously, the year futures are pricing in, I think, one right now, which is a big change from where we were coming into this year. Yeah, so the, the Fed saw the data, you know, it was stronger than expected. The Fed has, you know, didn't didn't pivot in terms of increasing rates more, but it just kind of sat there. And and this this to me is the, the big takeaway from the Fed for the year is Bob Elliott talked about this, is the Fed is both backward looking and slow moving. Um, and so the Fed is not like using these predictive models to determine what's going to happen in the future and adjusting their policy based on that when what, what they're seeing on the ground now is different than that. That's not like they cover themselves. They have to justify themselves to lawmakers. It, it, it's a very, very different world they operate in. I mean, I know a lot of us say, well, why can't they use more real-time stuff? And why can't they use predictive models? And you know, maybe their predictive models will be worse anyway. But the, the Fed is very, you know, the Fed see, moves when they see compelling reason to move. Um, and we kind of saw that with inflation. I mean, they moved later than a lot of people thought they were going to move up. And they're probably, you know, if you look in the history of when they have to cut, they typically don't have, you know, as much as we would love to have, you know, the soft landing with the 25 basis cut point cuts all the way along the way, that's not usually the way it works. Usually the way it works is something goes horribly wrong. You've got the 100 basis point cut. And so the, the Fed has just hasn't seen anything compelling this year to make them go one way or the other. I mean, I, I think that's the bottom line. And that, that's the point Bob was making. And it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's nothing in things are going fairly well. Inflation is, is above target, but it's not crazy above target that they want to go crazy aggressive to get rid of it. You know, economic growth is decent. I mean, there's just nothing in the data right now that would suggest if you're using this backward looking, slow moving approach, there's nothing in the data that would say, I, I need to make a move right now. And so they haven't made any moves. And until, until that happens, they're not going to. We all want to say when the facts change, I change my mind. We all, we all want to be able to say that. Not saying the Fed's perfect. I'm not saying the Fed's not without flaw, but the facts change, they change their mind. We've seen it repriced in futures markets. We've seen it repriced in the Fed curve. I think, and I know for, for me personally, the Silicon Valley bank failure and watching the way the Fed handled uh, that and measuring the situation coming out of that, I think was a real, a real modern era eye-opener where the 
interest rate curve made the adjustments that it made after the bank failure and made it look like we were certainly on our way to getting these cuts and everything else. The market priced in the expectations on the Fed based on the way that the markets understood the Fed to be thinking. As that got priced into the markets, that did some of the easing for the Fed. And without a commercial real estate disaster or a string of greater and greater bank failures, the negative scenario didn't materialize. And the market took back to reflecting, okay, the Fed's not going to cut, not going to cut, not going to cut. And that takes us all the way forward to today, where just seven months ago, where we were expecting six, seven, eight cuts in the year. And here we are midway through the year. We haven't cut a single time yet. The market is still adjusting around these things and changing. You know, we've seen just big changes, even in the mortgage market, some of the other places with the cost of borrowing and stuff going on. But what the Fed is doing is being very slow moving to the data. And every time the data has changed, it seems to have changed in a short enough time frame that the market's made a correction and the path is still there. They're, they're still on the track that they thought they would be on. And is it comfortable? No. Are we all looking at it going, surely this can't continue? Yes. I think the Fed's looking at it that way too. And what's interesting is this loop you just referenced is really interesting. Like you, you'll see some data that will cause more cuts to be priced in. Financial conditions will ease because of that. And then things will get stronger. And so it, it's sort of like you're fighting against yourself. You're kind of this, there's this equilibrium that kind of keeps you in the same place. Like if we get ahead of ourselves, you know, growth goes up. They're not going to cut like they're expected to and the, the cuts come out. So it's just been kind of like we, we stay the course. We're hanging out in the same place. And um, yeah, what's interesting to me, and I don't know how you think about this, is like how they're going to think about like the, if, if three and th to three and a half percent inflation is what we're going to get for a while, it's just going to kind of hang out there. We're not going to get the out of control inflation. We're not going to get the two percent inflation. What are they going to do with that? Um, it's interesting. It's above their target. Like their, their job is to get it back to the target. And we've had you know a period here, a very long period where we've been above the target. But what are they going to do? I mean, I don't think they would. I don't think they're going to aggressively try to get back. To, you know, 3% is not a terrible thing. What we're seeing right now in the economy is not a terrible thing going on. So it's not something that probably justifies, you know, continuing to hike hard into it to try to really get to 2%. It's something they're probably going to, you know, keep talking about having the 2% mandate, but they're going to live with it, um, I think. I think they're just going to kind of allow it to happen because the risk on the other side of we, we tighten even harder and we cause some sort of recessionary thing is too great. So I think that that's a plausible outcome here is we're just going to kind of live with this above average, but not crazy inflation. And that's just what we're going to have for a while. Remembering that there's the, there's the expectations that get priced into the market that are beyond what the Fed is doing. Like there's market implied expectations of what's going to happen with both interest rates and Fed fund futures that we can look at it. And then there's the reality and there's the theories or models that the Fed uses to basically determine where rates should be. And there's a bunch of variations on this stuff. We don't need to get into R squares and Taylor rules and stuff like that. This idea that when that gap between the expectations and the reality gets really wide, there's two ways for it to close. The Fed can make changes or the market can make changes and that can close it. It's a lot like the stuff we talk about with valuation multiples and everything else. There's a different thing in the numerator and denominator in each of these. And you have to understand the basic math around what solves that problem. So far, we've been surprised with, as is the market, that the market has self-corrected in these loops to make it so that the Fed didn't have to make a change. At some point, something's going to go outside of scope and the Fed will have to make a change. But as of, as of yet, the last few years at least, the Fed's been in a place where they just haven't had to move. And yeah, it's surprising, but we're going to find out what they do if inflation indeed stays sticky in that area like you just described. And, you know, the next thing that the next problem is going to be completely unpredictable. It's going to come from an area people don't see coming. And that's the way it always is. So for people who do what we do, it's very hard to do anything with this information. You know, we're not going to change the way we invest people. You're not going to change the way you do financial planning based on the fact of where the next crisis might come from. It's just it's going to be, diff you know, this is this is part of investing. This is why there's risk premiums. I mean, it's it's just the way it is. Yeah. And I mean, I know exactly what's going to happen, but I, I can't tell you. So yeah. You, yeah, I'm sure you've put on your positions uh, behind the scenes in the options market to uh, profit from yeah. that. So you don't want to, you know, you don't you don't need me front running you over there. The um, the whole YouTube podcasting thing. This is just a ruse yeah. from my uh, spaceship <laughs> on my private island in the Milky. Yeah, uh, let, let's talk about housing a little bit. This is a uh, this is a wild this is a wild chart. I think anybody who has a mortgage, we don't often think about 
back to like anecdote, the plural of anecdote is not data. We don't think about ourselves as that instance of the broader reference class with these mortgages. I'm sure, and you know, we've all been through this. Anybody who's been a homeowner, Jack, did you did you refinance because of rates at all in the last, I don't know, 10 years? Not in a while, yeah, in the last 10 years, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, you, it was something for a period of time way back you were doing fairly regularly um, because rates, rates just keep, kept coming down and it was justified. So it was something that was like part of, it's interesting, like I, I had like a, I knew the mortgage broker pretty well like back in the day, like it, you, you knew him well enough because you were refinancing enough. And it's like, if you think about that to today, it's, it's quite a change. Like I haven't spoken to a mortgage broker in a really, really long time and I probably won't be. And you probably won't be because of where rates are. This internal comparison thing of like, am I getting a deal? Should I be talking to the mortgage broker? Are there mortgage brokers cold calling me or cold texting me or whatever 24 seven today? The answer for most of us is no, because the refi activity is actually lower because rates are higher. So you don't want to refi to a higher rate. The purchase activity to higher rates go gets more stressed because it's harder to qualify for a mortgage and the desire of people to like sell that house. So the, you know, the mansion that got refinanced four times or not even the mansion, the suburban middle-class home that got refinanced four times when rates were lower, those people are going like, okay, well I could sell the house. I can get a little more money for it, but then I got to turn around and buy something else that the value's gone up by, and I'm going to get rid of my 3% mortgage, and I'm going to go in at 8% to start over, even though I'm 65 years old and whatever else. Seeing that as a, seeing your situation in the broader reference class is really important. This is a really important planning concept. I want to read this direct. Uh, this is Lee Bodoris commented on this again. Follow him on LinkedIn for stuff like this on the regular. So he showed this chart. And he said with it, uh, as of the end of last year, 46% of mortgages were 4% or less. 46% of mortgages were below 4%. And another 17% were between 4 and 5%. So we're basically getting to the point where like 60% of mortgages at the end of last year were sub 5% in yield. And that means homeowners who bought or refinanced homes before rates started to rise often feel stuck and if they were to sell their home and buy another, their new mortgage rate would certainly be above 6%, in many cases, likely closer to 8%. Therefore, these homeowners are less likely to sell unless they need some form of economic or for non-economic reasons and reduces supply. And without new supply, prices increase as a result. And shout out to everyone's economics 101 teacher, because new supply, of course, depends on three key tenets of real estate, location, location, location. Rates suck. The breakdown of rates and who has what's rate, what rate at what price from what period of time has changed the housing dynamic. When people look around and say post COVID, how is stuff not adjusted? This is a huge factor because again, if you are 60 years old and the kids are all moved out and the grandkids only come to visit once in a while, but you still have that big house and the mortgage is three and a half percent and it doesn't really make sense to sell and move and take on an 8% mortgage or whatever else in the town in Florida where you're really hoping to retire to, it's a way harder decision when the interest rate differential and spread in the last few years is so big. It's one of the many cases for the housing supply problem and one of the many cases why housing prices still have this painfully upward bias for anybody who's looking to move. This has been a huge lesson for me in terms of that I don't know what I'm talking about because you know if I had thought rates would go up as much as they did and housing prices would go up, like, I would have thought that was impossible. If you told me rates would go up that much, I would have told you you'd have a significant decline in the housing market. And so I take that and then I f use that to frame, well, what do I think about what's going to happen going forward? And basically, I have no idea because I, I would think if, you know, if we did, first of all, you have to predict what rates are going to do and no one can do that. But let's say rates did go back to 5% or, you know, something like that. What, what would happen to the housing market? I mean, I would think there'd be a lot. It would unlock a bunch of demand and prices would go up even further. But is it also going to unlock supply? All these people who haven't been selling are now going to sell. And maybe that's going to offset the demand or counteract it to some degree. I mean, it's just, I've learned that I have no idea what's going on with this. I mean, this, this is something I never would have thought of. But, you know, it's something I would have told you there was probably, you know, if you told me rates were going to go up that much, what, what are the chances housing would go up? I probably would have given you 10% at the most, um, probably less than that. So obviously I don't know what's going on. And, you know, when you have this weird dynamic, it's going to be, it makes it hard to predict what's going to happen in the future because, you know, people ask all the time, you know, what should I do with my house? And, you know, what do you think is going to happen with rates in the future and what's going to happen with the housing market? And I think this this demonstrated to all of us that this is a really, really hard thing to predict. And even the, the best experts got this wrong. I, I didn't see I saw very few people when rates initially went up saying this was going to happen, if any. Um, so it just shows we don't know. 
Um, it's it's a it's a dynamic market. There's a lot going on, and and who knows what's going to happen going forward. This one, and again, seeing it depicted this way in this graphic, that basically two thirds of mortgage have two thirds of mortgage holders have no incentive to make a change here. They don't have incentive to go out a new mortgage at a higher rate. They don't have this an incentive to refinance the existing mortgage. They have all the incentive to just sit there unless there's a non-economic reason for them to do something about it. And yeah, that got left out out of a lot of analysis on where home prices were going just a few years ago, especially after the COVID boom when everybody wanted to move and modify their houses. Fascinating piece of data. And also just a reminder, like you just said, makes it so hard to predict. Never forget the location, location, location. You got to make decisions in real time in the market that you're in for what serves you and in many cases, your family the best way. That's can't tell you how many of those financial planning conversations I've had in the last 15 years of this job. So let's talk, uh, let's talk stock market. And I put this in here because I've always wanted to say climbing the wall of worry. You see it all the time uh, in, in the media. And I, I've wanted to say it myself. So I'm, I'm going to say it. And I, and I think it probably is very appropriate to what's gone on this year. I mean, I don't think anybody thought we'd have the kind of market returns. And we'll, we'll get into the hood and talk about what's going on behind the scenes because the returns aren't as good in certain spots. But yeah, I, I don't think anybody thought we would have the kind of returns in the market we've had. And I don't think anybody in general, going back to the thing with rates, like if rates, be, if you look at the cumulative return of the market since rates have spiked up, it's, it's better than a lot of people thinks it, thought it would be. So, you know, I, I think, again, it, it just shows how hard it is to predict. And it also shows that there's always going to be this negativity out there. And sometimes on rare occasions, that negativity is going to be right, which is what makes it challenging because sometimes there was the negativity that sat around there in 2007 where the people who have been probably been saying it for a long time, but they got, they got things right. And so you're like, oh, I got to listen to these negative people. But that negativity is always out there. And, and I feel like right now it's definitely true. I mean, the commercial real estate market's going to blow up. Inflation's going to spike to out of control. I mean, I could go on and on about all the things that are out there right now that we should be very, very worried about. Um, so yeah, it's just the, the market has kind of ignored it. And it, it's why you know, for most people, buy and hold investing is a good thing to do because try, trying to figure this stuff out is incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult and incredibly painful. I always want to ask this. You always wanted to say climbing the wall of worry. I always wanted to know what the opposite of that phrase is. That's are a good we, question. Are we like jumping off the cliff of joy? Like what's the opposite Sliding of climbing? Sliding down the slide of uh, despair or something? Or I don't well, know. Well, no, because it has to be the opposite of despair. <laughs> like it's, um, yeah. Like climbing, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been thrown out the window of um, of bliss. Like, like yeah, I don't know. It's, like a reverse bungee jump up or something where I'm like launched. Up, I don't know. Um, well, I don't know what the something. reverse. Yeah, come up with something. Put it in the comments. I don't know what the, the reverse of climbing the wall of worry with me is. It's it's always a red flag if I can't find an opposite metaphor. And in, we don't really need the climbing the wall of worry because we pretty much are always doing it for the most part. It's, well, like, the when it, it's like this is the water in which we swim. Like this is air around us. Like there's not a seems scenario. Like when, when the wall of worry is not there, that's when you need to be worried. Like 1999, you know, it seems like the wall of worry had mostly gone away. I mean, there's some valuation people who were still out oh. there complaining, but there wasn't too much else going on. So, like, it seems like when the wall of worry is completely gone, that's probably a bad thing. Um, you, you probably should be concerned. And, and if there are all these things out there that, that could be problematic, you know, you take it as kind of like this is the way the market is. It's kind of a normal day-to-day -day thing. Yeah, getting crushed by the wall of worry or it tips over on you. Uh, yeah, I could start to see there's, there's maybe that's the way we have to think about it. So... This is one, and I think about this for this chart of Russell 1000 performance group by return buckets. Stock pickers, I'm sorry. It's been hard. Active fund managers, individuals with a personal account. It's been really friggin' hard out there. The amount of stocks when we break out by return in the markets for uh, who's basically getting the market return and or better. Jack, you want to just explain just how narrow the success rates have been? Yeah, well, this is interesting. And, I, and I've learned from Huberman that I shouldn't be doing math on, on live podcasts because uh, things could go wrong for me. But I believe uh, wrong. I believe 44% of, uh, if I've added those up correctly, 44% of, of stocks in the Russell 1000 were actually down, um, which is, you know, you think about that. I mean, it's a 15% it's a plus year in, you know, the S&P 500 and a little bit less than that in the Russell, but still, a, you know, in the Russell 1000, but still a, a really good year, um, certainly a 10% plus year. And 44% of the stocks have been down. It just it goes to the divergence of the whole thing. And, you know, your experience as an investor, and going back to what we talked about at the beginning is your own experience drives a lot of this. Your experience as an investor has been very different if you are, let's say you're a mag seven person who has like huge positions in those, or you're an index investor, or you're an equal weight investor, or you're a value investor. Like you, you, as you work down that, you know, that hill, 
basically the performance has gone down. As you get further and further from those huge companies, no matter what you've done for the most part, and we'll get the factors later, but it hasn't worked. So it's been, it's been a challenging market. It's been something where you're like, if you have clients who just sit there and you know follow the S and P 500 and don't really pay attention to what's going on, they see you know a pretty good market going on. Like people who are in the weeds, people who have these portfolios that deviate from the market, they see a very different market going on. So it's it's been very interesting. And you know we thought we had that big run in value, and we did have a big run in value for a little bit, but now we've kind of gone back in the other direction. Definitely, flip a coin. Throw a dart, whatever it is, odds are any individual security, any individual stock in the, you know, Russell 1000 or pick your index, you lost money. That's, that's the thing. You're underperforming or you lost if you flip a coin on this stuff. It's a very narrow window of people that have made money on this. I, I think I want to jump us to here. Uh, let's, let's jump to how concentrated the market is, because I think that that's actually a really interesting way to look at this. In, in the same sense, for those index fund investors who are feeling pretty good about themselves, They've avoided a lot of the losers. The the size, the percentage of those losers has gotten kind of shockingly small, I guess, historically in the last uh, last couple of years here. Yeah, they both these charts are from Michael Mobus and Paper, which is outstanding. So I would definitely I will link to it in the in the description. But it's yeah, this this is it's always good to put this in context. And what he's looking at here is the percent of total market capitalization of the top ten stocks, the top three stocks, and the top one stock, um, and what it's looked like over time. And it is, in, all these charts would show you that it's high. It's, it's close to the highest in the chart, although it was higher, you know, back in the, in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it, what this shows is the market is very, very concentrated. Um, but what's interesting is if we carry it down to the second chart, um, one of the things that's also concentrated is some of the fundamental data. So these companies are doing very, very well. This is, to me, is less like 1999 where you had a situation where you had concentration going up, but a lot of these companies weren't backing it up as much as they should have um, you know, with their actual results. You had a lot of multiple expansion going on. You're getting multiple expansion now, but if, if you look at that second chart, um, if you look at how much the top 10 can, contributes to economic profit, in, in 2023, it is a very big number as, as, a, you know, as a percentage of the whole thing. So these companies are killing it. Um, Google, Apple, you know, Amazon, NVIDIA, they're, they're all just killing it right now. And whether that'll continue is beyond my pay grade, but definitely there, there's an argument to be made that this is different from other periods we've seen in the past because the results are there behind the scenes for these companies. I want to ask you a question on this too. And I, I just think this is, it feels insightful, but I don't know what it is. Maybe we need to get uh, Michael Mobison on the uh, on the bat phone for this one. The, the relative change, because the other thing I look at this and I go, this is really interesting. 2021, 22, and 23, the contribution from the rest of the universe, like it's, it's, it's shrunk. And in particular, at least in the last two years, like that top 10 by market cap, like their contribution to economic profit, like it's continued to stage up. I'm not saying that this doesn't, like it doesn't indicate a reversal. It doesn't indicate anything's wrong, but it, it does indicate like, it's really interesting to me to just think about both the staying power in the top 10 by market cap. And also that like the rest of the universe, like that's where the contraction's been. Yeah, I don't have an. I mean, I would have to. Michael would be the better person to ask about this because I don't have. I don't have any great insights into it. But certainly, you know, what's been going on for these big tech companies has been, you know, exceptional. I mean, it, COVID definitely played a role in this. You know, people are using technology more. AI is going to play a role in this, although that really is not reflected in this chart because AI is sort of a thing for the future rather than the past. But yeah, definitely. I mean, these these companies have just been. I mean, think about what the role they play in our lives. I mean, I, you, all of us are touched by all of those companies in big ways. All of us spend, for the most part, at all those companies in big ways. Even if you're not, I mean, I, you're probably not buying the latest GPU from NVIDIA uh, to put in like your closet or something. Yeah, I'm buying fit. two in... of them. I got two. <laughs> right. Apparently, these things are massive, so I don't think it's going to actually fit in your closet. But you certainly are buying a lot of things. You know, you're, you're using things that are going to be driven behind the scenes by that. So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. This, this is something you see. You've, if you look at the top 10 companies in the S&P 500 over time, and you look at them decade by decade, they almost always are different. And, you know, I think about this a lot. Like, is it going to change this time? I'm not sure. Um, you know, I would think you would say that probably will change. There'll probably be these new tech startups we haven't thought of who will, you know, maybe it'll be open AI or whoever it'll be. Like other, other companies will take over and be these largest companies. But by the same token, like it just seems like everything that's happening is giving more and more and more advantage to these companies over everybody else. Um, and so maybe this is the time that it's different and maybe we're going to see them, you know, account for more and more economic profit. And maybe we're going to see them 
you know, get more and more concentrated. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, they certainly traded a big premium, you know, relative to a lot of other companies that are out there. You know, someone like me who's looking at fundamentals behind the scenes is seeing much more attractive values in a lot of other stuff other than them. But, you know, the problem with that argument is if they do exceed expectations, if it gets even, you know, more than people think it's going to be, then, you know, maybe they will. Maybe this will all continue. It's, it's hard. I mean, Michael Mobison's conclusion was not that this is some crazy, you know, if people want to look at that paper and find this is like some, this is some crazy bubble that's, you know, about to explode. I mean, that's, that's not the conclusion you get from the paper. You know, you, you get a balanced take on this, but you do get this idea, which is the second chart presents, which is these companies are representing a large portion of the economic profit of, of the market. And, you know, that, that does justify to some extent what's happened. Now, whether they've gotten ahead of themselves is a different, different discussion, but certainly there is a fundamental backing to what's going on here and, and whether it'll continue is a tough question to answer. It's really interesting too, especially with it being so tech heavy, that what you go through after the tech bubble where these companies are in many cases like the lowest contributors, but then paying for their woes, if you will, and then coming out of the great financial crisis and becoming the great engines of growth in our economy, there are broader cycles at play. And it's really fascinating to think about who evolves through what, how unpredictable this stuff is. And it feels like almost a good time that I should pitch you on my my AI closet startup that can hold more NVIDIA chips in the closet space in your home. Raise the value in your home. It's not a garage. It's an AI closet. <laughs> maybe, maybe when that gets funded, that might be the top. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll yeah, let you exactly. know when we're raising. If you got VCs knocking down your door, it'll be like when .com was put in the name in the late 90s and that was all it took. Uh, if, if that works out for you, your closet thing, then that's probably time. It's probably hey, time we've survived short. crypto in the name and we've survived AI in the name so far. So we'll see if the dot-com wreck is still waiting. So this next chart is one you actually put in. Um, and it, it's, it's really interesting to me because it's just like if, if you cut the chart in half, n not trying to predict what's going to happen in the future, but if you cut the chart in half, like we basically had zero periods of positive stock and bond correlation for a very long time. And now we've had three different spikes of positive stock and bond correlation, which to me would, would support the people whose argument is we're kind of in a re different regime now. You know, again, I don't know how it's going to play out, but we're in a regime now where this is possible. We were sort of in a regime where th this was not going to happen for a very long period of time. And you still have the periods of negative correlation, but we're in a regime where this is changing now. We're in a, we're in a regime where these spikes of positive correlation are possible. And, and it's interesting. We've talked in a lot of other episodes about what that means or doesn't mean for portfolio construction. But I, th that's what struck me is like, if you just drew a line down the middle of this chart, you've got a completely different world on the right side of it than you do on the left. Yeah. Pre-2020, you know, that 60-40 still at least gave you some times when it worked. There were a couple of pockets where you felt some of the pain, where you didn't get the benefits of diversification, but it was there. That's really, really important for uh, retirees. That's really, really important for people who need a diversified portfolio to spin streams of either like income or distributions off of. It makes it a lot simpler to do because you have a little bit more dependability on the zigging and zagging of assets. So in a stock market downturn, I can sell some bonds. In a bond market downturn, I could sell some stocks. It makes those decisions actually impactful. What we've seen in the last few years, and again, it's it's coming in these cyclical troughs. They're just trending above zero for the first time. To your point, you could draw the line in that chart and see the difference. And this is the part where it sucks the most. What do you do in a like in that 22 period when that was the year that both stocks and bonds both got hammered? Yeah. Is that data right? Okay. Yes. So in 2022, when both stocks and bonds got hammered, if you needed to take money out for your required minimum distribution or to pay for stuff to live on, when both those things are down, you know, high single, if not double digits in many cases, that changes that equation. Because now you're selling at a loss. You're taking money away from the portfolio. See our 4% rule episode. This is the stuff that ruins those scenarios. And it's supposed to be really, really low probability events. Since 2020, we've seen a break in these correlations. And it's come in increasingly sized waves now on three and if not four occasions. This is a really important data point because correlations are the core of diversification. I wonder if this is going to, and you probably know better than me, like, is this, if this continues, is this finally going to lead investors to maybe look at some of these risk parity, permanent portfolio type things or adding managed futures? I mean, a lot of that stuff is available now to your average investor and wasn't. And like, those things are good. You know, we, we, we argue you don't want to use those things to try to predict. So say like, well, I think inflation is going to spike. So I want to have those things. They're, they're more of an all weather thing. But what I would say is 
over that period we just went through where we had these three spikes of positive correlation, your ride was going to be much, much smoother if you had one of those things in place than if you had a 60-40 portfolio. So I wonder if that will lead more to more adoption of these types of things, if people will uh, you know, think about that. The combination of them being more available and also we're gonna, if we're going to be in this regime where you're going to see the, the, changing in the changes in correlation between stocks and bonds, like will that lead to those types of things doing really, really well? I mean, I think there's, there's a chance you're, the, those types of things investors will embrace them more than they have in the past. I want to make this point too. I'm going to grossly oversimplify something and insult a bunch of people, but it's worth it. Uh, in, <laughs> when you're doing due diligence or other work, how much do you think people anchor on like three and five year numbers for performance? Way, way more than they should. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's, and by the way, this is not just individuals. This is also institutions, everybody. Everybody loves those Very, numbers. very apparent in institutions and pensions and endowments and other things with like long-term money where you're trying to assess stuff against, especially against liabilities, not just your own personal ones. We are about to get and have been getting the solid three-year numbers are now a year to two years in the books and we're getting five-year numbers on these things. The risk parity strategies, the other ones, some of those have had a harder go because vol's been so lumpy. But if you want to look at one thing that's now getting five-year numbers and has everybody's attention because it's as a diversifier in the alternative space, here's your argument for, uh, you were at a financial pl planning presentation not that long ago, Jack. What investment product got pitched to you like crazy in that, in that session? Yeah, well, lots of different products, but everything was all about higher rates for longer. I mean, that, that's basically higher inflation for longer, higher rates for longer. Everything, everybody was making that case and then pitching something that they had that they thought would do well in that period. More private, like private equity, private credit, things like that on the private side of the equation? Yeah, I would say that there was definitely some of that, um, which, by the way, those arguments are not that strong. But nonetheless, yeah, there, there was definitely some of that going on. And this is the kind of stuff where those private diversifiers that get marked to market and don't have the same fluctuations that we've seen in stock and bond markets, this is a big thing. If there's something with the flows to private credit and some of the other stuff, again, not a, not a call against private credit, just a call to say, do your homework. Those things are getting their five-year numbers. When you stack these up against stocks and bonds, those numbers look really, really freaking good right now because this little piece of recent historical sample is kind of the dream scenario for those types of alternatives. Not saying it can't continue, just saying understand that in the rear view mirror, this is some best case scenario stuff that we're, we're seeing in the data. It's interesting because you're, you're basically going to have people maybe making the right decision for the wrong reasons. Um, you know, yeah. like embracing these multi-asset strategies, which actually are great things. You know, if, if you just look at the data, they're, they're superior to the 60-40 portfolio in a lot of ways, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. They're using three and five year returns, which is exactly what you don't want to use to make changes. So, I mean, maybe that's good. I, I don't really know. Uh, especially if in some cases you got above average results in that recent period of time uh, and maybe above average on a relative basis. And this would be part of my worry. The 60-40s had some, some really good, but some really rough years in the last few years. If you had a bigger private equity or private credit allocation during that period of time, your numbers are going to look a lot better because without the constant marking to market of daily prices, you didn't have some of that serial on performance or the breakdown in the correlations that you see on this chart. Again, it might be the right decision for the wrong reasons or the wrong rationale, but you have to unpack those things of do you actually believe those correlations to be true and with what economic drivers behind them when I see a chart like this that has such a clear dividing point in the middle, it's a red flag of, whoa, check your logic at the door. You might have to unpack stuff a little bit more than you're already thinking because th there's nuance that the way you zoom out is going to influence the way you think about this data. Right. And where people will pay for the wrong reasons part of this is if we get the left side of the chart again. Because then they've made the change right. based on three to five year returns. So if it goes back the other direction, they'll be like, well, these strategies were a bunch of garbage. They made no sense in the first place. And they're going to go right back to the, you know, to the 60, 40 type stuff. And, so, and you know, all those strategies cost more. All those strategies are a little bit harder to, inter, uh, to, to do. They all come with some extra strings attached and other things to them. And this is, this is part of why in that post-financial crisis period, like, hey, go out and buy, you know, an S&P 500 index fund and a... Lehman turned Barclays Ag, you know, bond product. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably doing pretty okay. And it was hard to beat. These things flip back and forth. Just be aware. So we're coming up on an hour. So we want to wrap up here. But one thing I did want to touch on before we finish is, is this factor performance. Because it's interesting. Like, I don't have full returns of the actual, like, factors. But it is interesting to kind of start with the S&P and work your way down. 
and just realize how worse things get if you add anything basically to that. So like the S&P's return for the first half was 15 and change. Um, the Russell 2000 was, I believe, down slightly or up slightly. Uh, I think it was actually 1.73 up. Um, so I think it was just barely positive. The MSCI was up 5.8%. So adding international, that, that didn't go well for you. The value indexes, um, the Russell 1000 value, 6.6%. The Russell 2000 value down 0.8%. Uh, so again, adding size, adding value, adding international, all of it, a, a disaster. Um, quality actually was okay. And this is, this is not the quality factor. This is just the quality ETF, which is the largest quality ETF. So 16.6%. That, that was okay. Um, that, that did okay throughout the year. Momentum was actually good. Um, I'm using MTUM here, but actually our, our friend Wes Gray's uh, Momentum ETF, QBOM, did really, really well too. So Momentum was, was the best factor in the first half. It actually worked out pretty well. Um, and then if you go into low volatility and minimum volatility, same thing. Like USMV, which is min vol, was about half the S&P 500. SPLV, which is low vol, was half of that. So a quarter of the S&P 500. So there was very little you could do in the first six months. If it, it was based on fundamentals in any way, there was very little you could do to beat the S&P 500. And that, that's the continuation of a decade-long story. Um, there hasn't been much you can do to beat the S&P 500. All, all these different factors or stock picking strategies, and you know, a lot of it is just detracted from your returns. The biggest companies have won. And th who knows what that means for the future, but it, it's interesting after having a period where value did really, really well. I mean, a lot of these value strategies have very good three-year returns now. Um, we, we sort of saw a reversal in the first six months. Should have listened to Rick Ferry, man. We all should have listened to Rick Ferry. <laughs> Well, he allowed, he allowed for a little bit of the small value exposure, but the part you should have listened to Rick Ferry about is he also talked about if you're going to have it, have a 20-year time frame um, because right. it, these things are going to go through really long periods where they don't work. So if you're, if you're looking at six months of returns, it, no matter what you're invested in, a factor or an active manager, like if you're looking at six months of returns and you're being like, I got to make changes based on these six months, like it, it's not going to work out for you. You probably should be an index investor or, or something. You know, Whatever you're judging yourself against as a benchmark, you probably should be invested in that because you, you just you can't handle deviations. But it is interesting, and we'll, we'll see what happens going forward. But yeah, I mean, size, bad. Value, bad. Quality was okay. Momentum was good. Low volatility, bad. Um, most fundamental stuff was bad. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the next six months. We'll do this again. But uh, yeah, it, it hasn't been a fun time for anybody using fundamentals. Well, may the, may the large tech gods ever be in your favor, everyone. And the good news is... I mean, the good news is, is it's six months. It's six months. This is a blip. This is a drop in the bucket in the grand scheme of history here. But it, it has been a really weird last six months, if not last 18 months of all of our lives in investing in markets. And that's why I think it's really good. I'm really excited we did this series uh, or we're, we're doing this series here, Jack, because we get to talk about just checking in with some of these charts and some of this data. And it's, it's important to have these conversations in public. It's important to see these things and just check in with is what's in our brains actually what's happening in the world. Yeah, and even though we're not predicting anything, I think these, these charts are all really interesting because they, they help us understand what's going on behind the scenes. And I, and I feel like everybody, you know, when you're more informed, when you understand what's going on behind the scenes, you, you make better decisions. So although we didn't, if you wanted the next great investment strategy, we didn't necessarily give it to you here. Um, I, I think we have found some interesting things and, and we're going to keep doing this going forward. You know, every, every six months or so, we'll, we'll collect charts throughout the quarter that we think are interesting. And every six months or so, we'll, we'll break them down and, and see what we take what we take from them. Sounds like a plan. Send your charts in. Give us good stuff to do. And, uh, you know, when when my AI closet project gets off and running, I'll be back to pitch funding. I'll be, I'll be your first investor. Okay, first. Um, thank you for everybody for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Hi, guys. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at PracticalQuant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono, And follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube, or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.